We're going to get started now. Here you go, Pat. So everyone's awake. Everyone's exhilarated. Everyone's excited. All right, we, uh, we save the almost best for last, because I'm last. Um, so uh, to my right, I don't think uh, he needs an introduction, but I wanted to say uh, maybe one kind word, because that's all I have for him also. Um, no, uh, Dr. Shai is, uh, you know, one of my heroes, along with uh, the rest of the docs and Zuckner and and Dr. Severin, who's with us, and Rabbits, uh, and Shear, who have been alongside me on a, on a journey called STAR that we uh, created together about 48 months ago. And Dr. Shai has dedicated his whole life uh, to CMT and helping families, helping patients, and doing uh, the research necessary to get us to what you're about to hear from Doc Shai of where we stand on a research basis. Um, I once asked M um, Doc Shai, I call him Mike, uh, for a resume uh, so I could announce him at another function in New York about four years ago. And what did I get? I got 40 pages of a CV. Every paper he's published, every board he's been on, every institution that he's impacted. And it's not a, uh, a coincidence when you see people show uh, some of the work uh, that Dr. Shai uh, is uh, attributed there because he truly is one of the fathers of uh, CMT and a world-renowned expert. Uh, I was in uh, Belgium in June for the CMT consortium meeting. Uh, every other year, uh, it's here. And uh, when this guy walks in, and he, he's like, uh, you know, name, name the biggest country star or rock star. This guy, it parts sea, you know, the seas are parted when this guy walks in in the CMT community. You know, with that, Mike, I don't have too much more nice things to say as we fight all the time. Uh, but here, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mike Schein. Well, thank you very much for the kind words, Pat. And uh, can you hear me in the back? Okay. And thank you all for coming out. And I especially like the part of the introduction when he said I devoted my a whole life to this because I'm going to go back because uh, my mother's staying with us now and I'm going to tell her that those first 20 years when she thought I was uh, messing around and not doing things <laughs> I was supposed to, I was devoting my life towards CMT. So. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is change the topic a little bit from what's in uh, the handout because I know everybody is excited about a lot of the research that's going on. And so I'm going to give just a quick overview of CMT, and then I'm going to talk about some of the uh, research projects that are going on, but just briefly. And then I'm going to uh, uh, stop about uh, halfway through and just throw it open for questions. And it's uh, a challenge to you, because if you don't have questions, I have a whole boring talk I can uh, pull up in, and I'll give that instead. So the pressure will be on you guys. So just to briefly go over what we're talking about, and I realize this audience knows this uh, well, but we're talking about uh, Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease, which is an inherited peripheral neuropathies, and these cause weakness. And I'm just looking for the pointer here. I don't know what I'm finding. If it moves, I'll be afraid of it here. And I'm hoping I can figure this out because I saw that Rick couldn't figure it out. So this is my challenge. <laughs> and I think I've, I've failed. So uh, the, uh, in any case, CMT uh, it causes weakness and wasting in the hands and feet. It causes uh, uh, problems where sometimes people need uh, uh, bracing to walk. 
but sometimes it causes much more severe diseases, uh, such as the young man in the lower left, and that's uh, uh, the full extent of his movement uh, of what you see in that picture. Sorry, I'll just go, go without it, but let's, let's see if we can get back connected. So I'm doing worse than Dr. Finkel, which I'm sure he'll <laughs> be happy to let me know. <laughs> and this is the, the sky uh, at night. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. And, and as we've talked about, uh, CMT which are problems with the peripheral nerves, the nerves that have left the back and going out to the hands and feet, uh, uh, come in two big groups. One group affects the myelin, uh, which is the insulation around the nerve, and the second group affects the nerve fiber itself, uh, which we call the axon inside uh, the myelin. And we use those to separate out CMT into roughly CMT type 1 and CMT type 2. And I think the clinical uh, hallmarks you can see below, and I'm not going to just repeat them. But uh, we now, uh, with the age of uh, molecular genetics, are able to divide CMT into various groups. And we can come back to this perhaps with some of the questions later, but on the left, we have CMT type 1 with slow nerve conduction velocities, CMT type 2 with normal nerve conduction velocities but small waves on the nerve conduction machine, and those are inherited in what we call autosomal dominant fashion. So if you have it, you have a 50% chance of passing it on to your kids. Uh, if, you don't get, if they don't get it, they can't pass it on further. Then we have recessive forms where you need to get a mutation from each family. And then we have an X-link form, which it depends upon the sex of the person, uh, how severely they're affected or if they're affected. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this now, but we can come back to that during the question period if you'd like. Now, you've also heard this a few times today, but there are more than one genetic form of CMT type 1 or type 2 or type 4, and these come from mutations that are scattered throughout all the chromosomes, and uh, this, change, this slide changes almost uh, uh, weekly now, but currently I believe there are 73 different genes that are, are known, and this gets into a diagnostic question because only about 20 of those are available commercially. And the way we subtype now is when we know the gene, we give it a letter and we place it into the type 1 group if it's demyelinating and autosomal dominant, or type 2 if it's axonal and autosomal dominant, and uh, uh, type 4 if it's recessive. So just as an example, type 1A is a problem with a duplication of a gene called PMP22. Uh, type 2A is a mutation in a gene called mitofusin 2. Type 4A is a gene called GDAP1, and all those other letters uh, stand for specific genes that cause CMT with that type of inheritance. Now, when I first started uh, in uh, my residency, and this was in the early 1980s, there wasn't very much exciting going on in the world of CMT. We knew that they were demyelinating or axonal, but we didn't know how common they were, and we didn't even know how many different forms there were. And all of these advances uh, have occurred uh, really since uh, the early 1990s, and we'll go through some of them, but I'm always, you know, I, I recognize when people come to the clinic that we talk about the research, and there's no pills to take yet to make any type of CMT uh, get better. But just what's happened now uh, since uh, uh, the 1990s or the year 2000 makes it, to me, seem 
like really realistic that uh, 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 we're on the verge of actually creating some of these medications. And uh, hopefully I can uh, share some of that enthusiasm with you as we go forward here. Now, one of the issues that's difficult uh, for people when they find they have CMT is with 70%, uh, excuse me, with more than 70 different genes causing CMT, uh, it, it seems like an impossible task to uh, identify the causal gene in families. But as we've accumulated patients, a group in London, a group in the States, and groups in France have all found the same thing that in 2000, and uh, 13, if you have an identifiable form of CMT that can be found without doing exome sequencing for novel forms, for example, in over 90% of the cases, you're gonna have a mutation in just one of those four genes. PMP22, gap junction beta one, which makes connexin 32, myelin protein zero, and MFN2. So the next few slides are just for people who are thinking about trying to get CMT diagnosed in their family and, uh, uh, how, and dealing with the cost of how expensive it can be and just trying to uh, focus on the testing. So if you go to a facility such as any of the CMT centers of excellence, they typically will examine you, uh, take a history, and then they will do nerve conduction velocities. And the way we work this is we separate out the nerve conduction velocities in the arms, which normally should be more than 45 meters in a second. And we separate them into slow, which is 15 to 35, very slow and intermediate and normal. And then we use that to group along with the age of onset in terms of walking. And what we do is that we can then basically focus on which of those types of CMT to look for. So if somebody comes in with very slow nerve conduction velocities and they walk later than 13 or 15 months of age, we may say of those four genes, it's really good to look to see if you might have a mutation in the myelin protein zero gene and have CMT1B, for example. And uh, if you have intermediate nerve conduction velocities, then we might ask if you have any evidence of male-to-male -male transmission in the family. And if you don't have male-to-male -male transmission in the family and you have a classical CMT phenotype which affected you in the first two decades of life, we'd look right away for CMTX. If you had an axonal form of CMT, particularly if it was severe in childhood, we'd look to see if you have a mutation in mitofusin 2, which would mean you have CMT type 2A. And I'm actually missing the most common form here, which is if you had nerve conduction velocities between 15 and 35 meters per second, and you walked by around a year of age, but you were clumsy growing up uh, during the first two decades of life, we'd be almost certain that you'd have CMT type 1A, and we would focus testing for that. So I went through these slides very quickly, but just the idea is to point out that if you do have CMT and you're interested in making a genetic diagnosis, uh, the costs and the approach can be focused based on just examining you and doing uh, the neurophysiology. So this is why I feel like my talk is a little bit disjointed today because I'm gonna leave this here and come back and maybe we'll discuss some of these issues during the question periods. But I'm gonna switch gears now to go to some of the reasons that uh, people who are working in the field are excited about CMT uh, uh, today in a way that wasn't possible back in the 1980s. So this is a cartoon by Chris Klein and uh, it's just, I can't point with the arrow even on my uh, computer here. Uh, but what it shows is it shows a nerve fiber going to a muscle or a sensory ending, and uh, it shows the myelin insulation around the nerve fiber. And all of those letters, which you can't easily read, are the different genes that cause various forms of CMT. And as we said, there's over 70 at the moment. 
and I think both Stefan and Rick talked on this earlier, uh, for people trying to understand and develop rational treatments, when we get all these 70 uh, genes and we see the proteins they make and we see what the proteins do, we get actual pathways inside the cell and we can see how the molecular basis for demyelination occurs and we can also see the molecular basis by which axons degenerate. And this allows us to uh, 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 take a rational approach to design treatments. And what do I mean by rational? Well, when, I, when my car breaks down, I don't take a rational approach. I kick the tire, I curse, and then I turn it off, and then I come back five minutes later, and I hope that it will work, and it won't. <laughs> so that's just hoping that you're going to find a cure for this car. But if I actually understood something about the motor and what was connected to what and what the, the actual engine structure was and function was, then I can actually take a rational approach uh, to fix it. And that's what know, knowing all these 70 genes, proteins is, because it shows where in pathways in the cell we can intervene to uh, try to fix uh, demyelination or axonal damage. And I think that uh, with the leadership, with Pat and with Herb and Elizabeth and other people in the CMTA, I think that they've taken the anti-Mike Shy kick the tire approach to try to uh, develop treatments for CMT. So first of all, instead of getting people running the show who just know how to kick a tire, they've gone and really looked worldwide thrown egos out of the equation and trying to find the best people around the world who know something about the biology of myelin or axons. And then they've tried to take a rational look at what type of uh, approaches would be most likely to be successful to really develop treatments for the various types of CMT. And the starting uh, uh, disorder was CMT1A, which I'm going to just talk about for just a minute here. Uh, now, CMT1A is the most common form of CMT. So despite all the fact, despite there being 70 different genes that cause CMT, half of all families with CMT have CMT1A. So it's by far the most common. And uh, it also has an advantage that other types of CMT don't have for treatment, and that's that it's based on dosage, not on a mutation within the protein. So what do I mean by that? Well, this cartoon on the left is a cartoon of PMP22, those four tubes with the circles on the top and, and the lines coming out the bottom. This is what we call a tetra for four membrane protein that's in myelin, and uh, it was first discovered in 1992, and we still don't know its exact function, but it's in myelin. And normally, like any other uh, protein and the gene that makes it, you get two copies of the gene. You get one copy from your mom and one copy from your dad. Okay? But that's not what happens in CMT1A because on one of those chromosomes, and it's on chromosome 17, there's a duplication so you get an extra copy of the PMP22 gene. You don't get a mutation within it. You get a normal appearing PMP22, but you get an extra gene for it. So instead of make, having two copies make PMP22 protein, you get three copies that make it. So you end up with too much of the protein, and that causes uh, CMT1A. Now, in other families, that same region of the protein, instead of getting duplicated, gets uh, eliminated. So we call that a deletion. So now, instead of getting two copies, you get one copy. And there you get a totally different disease, which is called hereditary uh, neuropathy with a liability to pressure palsies. And it took me five years to learn how to say that. So that's my <laughs> least favorite uh, name for a type of CMT. But what that shows us is that it's the dose, it's the amount of PMP22 uh, that's made that causes a disease, and the CMTA and the STAR initiative uh, uh, considered that if we could figure out a way not to alter the 
coding of the gene, but just to decrease the amount that's made, we could actually f develop a rational treatment for CMT1A. And the idea then was, well, how would one go about that? And the CMTA group thought that with all the pharmaceutical companies out there and all the medications that are being made for various diseases, that there's literally millions of candidate drugs out there and maybe something that already exists can decrease PMP22 a bit. And if we just had a way to screen for that, we might be able to develop a rational treatment. And so this was the beginning of STAR, and it was just a few years ago. And what was decided was to find a way to look for an effect of a drug on PMP22. And I'm not going to show, I think I have a couple of slides here about this, but I'm going to just say in the beginning, uh, it's hard to measure the amount of PMP22 in a dish. Uh, you have to do molecular techniques to, uh, 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 to even identify the, uh, the gene or the protein. But if you could somehow modify that gene so that it would do something like glow when it's made, then you would be able to screen for compounds that might be able to uh, regulate the uh, PMP22 dosage. And that's what this shy slide is trying to show, that it, uh, if you took something from fireflies, for example, so what do fireflies do? They glow. And why do they glow? Because there's a gene called luciferase that they make that uh, uh, emits a green uh, a light. And so if you took the luciferase gene and link that up somehow with the PMP22 gene, then you could have cells that would glow, and you could then see how much of the gene was being made by how bright the glow was. And that's sort of at the heart of what uh, the STAR initiative did with CMT1A. And the reason you see all these different species here is that we had to decide where to put this fluorescent uh, PMP22. And one place you could have put it is in a, a mouse or in a worm, but if you did that, you'd only be able to screen 10 compounds a day or, or over a few weeks, or maybe 1,000 compounds a day. But if you made a cell line, which is over at the right, you could do what's called a high-throughput screen. And then you could look at uh, literally hundreds of thousands of compounds. And that was all well and good. But then we had to figure out somebody who could make these cells so that they would all behave the same way because if we're screening hundreds of thousands of cells in a dish, we need to know that cells in every well of every dish behave the same way. And fortunately, John Severin just left so I can say things that are nice about him and I won't have to uh, you know, say that I said it later. But he has just done a spectacular job, as did Yuli Suter uh, uh, before him, to develop cell lines that we use in these high-throughput screens and assays that we use in them. And this is just uh, a complicated uh, figure. Just uh, if you look in the right with, those, with that uh, yellow cell and the PMP22 F Luke at the right and the beta lac below it, these are just two reporters like that green, green fluorescence that John hooked up to the PMP22 gene so that when the cells uh, express either luciferase or something called beta-lactamase, you can measure it and you can see if they're making a lot or a little. And you can see if you look at compounds, if they decrease the brightness of the signal. And I'm not going to spend time on the rest of uh, the figure there. I think that's the main theme. Now, we have people like John, who uh, was recruited from the University of Wisconsin, and we had Yuli Suter, who was uh, uh, recruited to this project from Zurich, Switzerland, because they were the best. And then we needed to find a facility where they could actually do the screen that was also the best, because if we're talking about uh, really doing this carefully, we have to have everything precise by the best possible people. And this is Jim Inglis and uh, Sung Wook Jang, who work with Jim. And this is their system. And uh, this is uh, basically uh, uh, a high throughput screen in action. So these are robots, and they're going to pick up these plastic plates. They see they're rotating in that uh, machine. And each one of those plates has 1,500 wells in there. 
that contain exactly the same depth and can handle exactly the same amount of liquid, which is 20 nanoliters. And those computers, those robots rather, put that amount of cells in those, and then uh, they uh, grow, they emit a green light, and then the computer, or excuse me, the robot, then squirts serial dilutions of each of, candidate, each of thousands of candidate medicines into those wells, that incubates, and then they go through a fluorescence reader and the amount of light emitted is calculated. And you can do this with thousands of compounds and there are libraries of these compounds. Some are FDA approved, uh, some aren't yet FDA approved, and these are high throughput screens in action. And this is just an example uh, of that. And what I want you to focus on here is the left side of the screen because the question is, well, what happens if you find something, a compound that reduces the amount of PMP22, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in this assay? And the answer is you have to have other downstream or subsequent assays that you do to fine tune it to make sure that you get it right and that you have compounds that really will have an effect. So downstream from that, as you go down the, uh, the column on the left, you do a technique called PCR, which sees if there's really effects on PMP22 itself without that fluorescent reporter. And then ultimately, you want to look at it in uh, animal models. And the animal models that we, the CMTA, is using uh, were generated by Klaus Nave, again going around the world. This Klaus Nave is in Germany, uh, and there's a mouse model. Uh, so Klaus Nave made the rat. There's a Dr. Bass who's in the Netherlands who made a C3 mouse. And I think this is also to give credit where credit is due is really a, a consequence of Pat's leadership. Because originally we would have said, well, when we find candidate compounds, we'll ship them to Klaus or Frank and have them see if, the, uh, if these medications are effective in the animals. But I think that wasn't good enough for what uh, Pat and all of us want the CMTA to become. So what they've done is that they've basically purchased these animals from the investigators and housed them in a facility uh, in Terrytown, New York. And now there's colonies of these animals which are directly under the control of the CMTA to test as many compounds as we can uh, find. So there are candidates coming through this. They're being uh, screened or ready to be screened in animals. They would then go to uh, clinical trials in humans. But again, the idea is to have all of this be done uh, the best way possible so we'll never be able to look back and say, if only we'd gotten this or that person involved or we had a better setup. So again, this is, I think, the philosophy of the STAR initiative and what's been built by the CMTA. Now, that's one approach to CMT, uh, uh, to CMT1A. But there's other types of CMT, and I'm not going to go through all of them that the CMTA is involved, but uh, these include CMT2A, CMTX, and as I'll show you, we're starting a project with CMT1B. And as we go through this, and this is another lesson we learned from John Severin, is that we always have to try to develop better and better assays so when we get candidate drugs to patients, we can be really sure that they work. And one thing that we were missing was a human cell line. So in other words, we were talking about cells in incubators, uh, we were talking about uh, rats or mice, but before you actually go to human beings, we were missing a step, we were missing a human step. And this is where uh, work that was started by Mario Saporta is now being done by John uh, Severin, uh, uh, sort of comes into play because this is a technology when you can, again, make what we talked earlier about as personalized medicine. You can take a skin biopsy sample or a fat sample or maybe blood cells and you can turn them back in time and have them be stem cells. And what I'm gonna show you is work that Mario has started uh, and we're doing with CMT type 2A. So CMT 2A uh, is uh, the most common form of CMT type 2. 
and it's caused by mutations in a gene called mitofusin 2. And this is a busy slide, but on the bottom, it just shows a list of many of the CMT2A mutations. And so what Mario wanted to do was take skin biopsies from patients, grow up the skin cells, which are called fibroblasts, and then, then send them back in time to make them what we call stem cells. And so these didn't start from embryology. These started from adult tissues. They started from skin cells. And taking them back to become stem cells is called making them uh, immortalized pluripotential stem cells. Pluripotential means you can then turn them into anything. And these are just a list of some of the uh, uh, biopsies that Mario did. And this is what he did with the CMT2A uh, 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 cells. So he turned them into stem cells, which is a blue dish on the, on the left. But then what he did was he used certain uh, compounds to cause these cells to grow up again, to differentiate. But this time he did it in such a way that he tricked them because they didn't go back to become skin cells. He had them become nerve cells. So these are now neurons, and I don't know if you can see in this light, but on the top, if you look at that green ribbon across the top, that's the axon of this uh, uh, nerve cell that he's made starting from a skin fibroblast. And on the bottom, it's just a way of measuring transport in those axons of mitochondria up and down the axon. So again, we talked earlier today about axonal transport and its role in axonal forms of CMT. So again, the purpose here is just showing the CMTA is getting involved in uh, making stem cells uh, uh, to be able to be used for assays uh, for various compounds in CMT type 2A, but also in other types of CMT. And we are currently banking these, which is what this slide is just to show. So when people come into the clinic sometimes with uh, genetically defined uh, uh, forms of CMT, we will perform skin biopsies, grow them up, uh, grow the skin cells up and freeze them. And then for the various types of CMT uh, for research projects, we'll turn those into neurons or with John Severin's uh, efforts, even into Schwann cells so that we have human patient-specific cells to look at in these assays that the CMTA is developing. Now, I'm gonna to switch to another part of CMT that the CMTA is just starting, and that's gonna be similar types of uh, projects, but this is looking at CMT1B, which is caused by mutations in the myelin protein zero. <coughs> And I'm just going to show you this one slide about it, uh, which is to show, uh, first of all, that we're doing the same type of approach with CMT1B that we're doing with other types. So we're starting to develop cell lines for high throughput screens. We're going to take them uh, down through secondary and tertiary screens. We're going to make uh, stem cells from those. But as with the others, we're going to use uh, animal models, and for CMT1B, we already have animal models. So I don't know if people have ever seen a mouse with CMT, but I'm going to show you one here. If I can, oh, actually, I might not be able to, because if I can get this, there it goes. Oh, I got the arrow working, too. So I want you to look. There's two mice here and see if you can tell which mouse has CMT. See, and the mouse with CMT who's not working as, uh, as fast and who has his legs splayed out there, he has slow nerve conduction velocities. He has all the features of CMT. So when you have candidate medications, you can take uh, those medications in through an animal model to see if there's an effect there, which is important to do because when we give medications to patients, we have to make sure that the medications get to the nerves or the myelin, and we have to make sure that they're safe. Okay, so one of the things that's been sort of talked to a little bit today is the scope of the CMTA and all the work uh, that we're doing. And we've sp spoken of it as uh, being international, and we've talked about centers of excellence. So what I'm going to try to do in the next few slides is show you that, but I also am going to uh, try to address another important question. 
And so this will give me a chance to uh, take a 10 second pause because I'm gonna ask you for some advice here. So if we had a candidate medication, if it worked perfectly, the CMT would go away instantly. That I understand. But these are chronic diseases, and maybe the CMT uh, won't go away instantly with a medication. So how would we know if a medication is effective? Okay, so you got... Okay, performance of a, of a person, okay? And so what would we want that person to do? Okay, well, we'll get to that. To that. Okay, no, I'm with you. So you want to see if they could either do things they weren't doing before or maybe if they've been getting worse, if they got worse a little bit more slowly. Is that fair? Or? And, and how would, would, we be, would we be able to measure that? Well, nerve conduction velocities, it's a, that's a, a good answer, uh, but with, even with the demyelinating types of CMT, like CMT1A, how slow the nerve conduction velocities are doesn't correlate with how much problem somebody has. So you can, ha and uh, if in models of demyelination, if you get better, uh, and there's a disease called Guillain-Barre that this is an example of, uh, your nerve conduction velocities stay slow. So the nerve, changes in nerve conduction velocity are something that we thought of, but they don't correlate with uh, improvement. You can measure walk. But, 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 so if we got a few people there and somebody walked faster than somebody else, how would we know? Uh, maybe they were having a good day or a bad day. Yeah, yeah. And so you, I'm sorry? Patient reporting. Patient reporting. Well, the gene is still be there, but if, if, if you had CMT, and uh, this is, a, you know, as I've, I think it's, as I've sort of learned over the years here, if uh, somebody comes in to me and they still can't walk better than they walked the last time I saw them, and I say, well, your nerve conduction velocities are better, or your uh, gene looks, looks improved, and you can't do anything different, you say, well, you know, big deal, and perhaps even with a word in the middle there. <laughs> so what I'm driving at is that we realize that as we go to clinical trials with these medications, we have to be able to measure change, and we have to be able to measure it in a way that isn't screwed up by me doing a bad job one day or a better job the next day, you need to develop outcome measures that can measure progression over time. And you need to do it in a way that's standardized so that if I see a patient or Rick Finkel sees a patient or Mary Riley sees a patient in England or Davide Parison sees a patient in uh, uh, Milan, that we all see patients the same way. We all measure things the same way. And that was the genesis of this uh, consortium and again, to give the C CMTA credit, uh, the CMTA started the initial part of this with a database in about 2002. So this has sort of evolved from that. And what we have now is, we, actually this top line is out of date. We have 17 sites uh, from all around the world doing research on CMT, and we collaborate on clinical data and samples and we, when we have novel forms of CMT, we work with Stefan to get DNA to him to try to identify new causes. And we also use this to try to look for modifier genes that modify the severity of something like CMT1A. And it's not just because we're curious about that, it's that if we find modifier genes, then we have other genes to target to try to develop treatments because we could use those to affect the severity. And this, these are funded, uh, started with the CMTA, then came the MDA, and now we're funded by the National Institutes of Health, and this is called uh, the Inherited Neuropathy Consortium. And these are the 17 member sites, and I don't expect you to be able to read those, but it's just that these are centers from all across the world, and as I'll show you, we're cross-trained on all these outcome measures so that we can actually detect changes and progression in a reproducible way. And this is just some numbers from the consortium that for the last four years, we've evaluated approximately 4,200 patients. Uh, 
people care about treatment results, not just about publishing, but uh, it's over 118 manuscripts have been published, and we've been publishing on doing these natural history studies, developing and measuring outcome measures, and uh, uh, the other items that you see here. And this is for people to come to our clinics who are adults, one of the standard ways that we evaluate uh, uh, CMT in adults, we do what's called a CMT neuropathy score. Now this score was used in clinical trials in Europe and in North America for CMT1A. And this is the vitamin C trials that some of you may know about. And the vitamin C did not change the course of CMT1A. It was a negative trial. But it also showed that when people are really involved in a study as opposed to just regular natural history, that the overall course of the disease can change a little bit. Because before the studies, the CMT neuropathy score would get worse by about a point and a half uh, uh, over two years. With the study, even the placebo group did not get worse at all. Everything sort of stabilized. It doesn't mean that the CMT1A got, got better. It just means that the score wasn't sensitive enough to detect normal progression. So we modified that uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, three or four years to a form that's called CMT Neuropathy Score Version 2. And to make sure uh, that everybody gets uh, evaluated the same way, we have to be trained. Uh, every year we get together, we see patients in common, and then we have a video training program, which I'm going to show you for two reasons. One, to show you a couple of components about it. But the second is it's the only chance I get to talk, to get a word in while Mary Riley is talking. So, so this is, this is, this is Mary, and she's okay, talking about do uh, doing the pin prick examination. And again, okay. everybody Can has to say the question in okay, the same way. Yeah, right, so what I'm going to do is get you to close your eyes mm -hmm. and ask you, does it feel like a pin? Okay. Close your eyes, does that feel like a pin? Does that feel sharp? Yeah. Okay. That's sharp, mm -hmm. and that's blunt. Right. Do you appreciate a difference? I do appreciate it. Okay, that. now I need you to tell me what I'm doing. Is it sharp or blunt? Blunt. Sharp. Okay, so we now need to find out is the feeling the same here as in the top of your leg, so we have a point that's normal. Mm -hmm. So does the sharp pin here mm -hmm. feel much the same as the sharp pin here? Mm -hmm. It does. Okay, so that's what we're going to call your normal pin. And that was for the pin prick, and this is for using a special kind of tuning fork. This is an instrument, which is a tuning fork we use to test vibration. How you make the tuning fork vibrate is you catch it on both sides, and you have to do it such that this black triangle completely disappears. As the vibration disappears, the black triangle appears, and it's graded 0 to 8, and you can work out the point at which the patient no longer feels it. So the first thing we're going to do is see... And so the, everybody who is in the consortium that examines patients has to uh, see patients together and has to get a score that's within a point of the other person at annual meetings. And then uh, this, uh, that video with Mary is online for all new centers that join, and they have to uh, pass uh, 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 a test to be sure that they evaluate the patients the same way. Every time a person comes in, the same set of instructions are given to them, and it has to be done exactly like Mary uh, did it there. And, uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah and, and also, you, most people speak slightly more slowly. So. <laughs> but again, the point I'm trying to make is that this way, we try to have everybody seen uh, and evaluated in exactly the same way, and we put the CMT neuropathy score and other outcome measures are all computer are, are all uploaded onto computerized databases which are actually housed at the University of South Florida. So now we have a database where we look at how patients come in and then we see them on roughly a yearly basis and all of their follow-up visits are there. So now we're developing the natural history not only of CMT1A but all the types of CMT and we have Every type of CMT that we see patients, the patients are evaluated in that standardized way, and that data is available for analysis, for natural history studies, so that we know what the normal change is. Now, 
With this, we also realized that uh, we didn't uh, really have a way to evaluate kids, and Rick Finkel did a beautiful job this, um, this morning talking about how to do the, uh, the CMT PEED score that we developed and was published in uh, uh, 2011. And he talked about how you can use it to see where problems might be that can help tailor individual treatment. But another way we can use it is to do that same kind of uh, natural history studies, but with kids uh, that we couldn't do with the CMT neuropathy score. And so this is just a slide showing Rick and Josh Burns, who was also very instrumental in developing the score. And this is just the score that Rick showed uh, this morning, but I'm just gonna go through it a little bit in a slightly different way to show you how it's used in, in natural history studies. So this is divided up into multiple components. I think there's nine or 11, I forget actually the number. And when a, a child comes in, we get their height, weight, age, and gender, and that's important because we need to normalize for all of that as we go forward. Then the next component of this is gonna be the hand dexterity testing, and I think uh, uh, Rick uh, uh, showed you this. And at the time of this, I was a Michigan State fan because we were in Detroit, so there the, for the hat. <laughs> and then we measure strength in a quantified way with these dynamometers. And again, everything is done in a standard way. Everybody is trained, just like I talked about for the adult score. Then sensation. And we, I learned that pin pricks, if you use just a safety pin, that uh, I don't know if people knew this, but all safety pins are not the same in terms of sharpness. And we now spend $20 a box for those uh, neuro tips in which uh, they've been standardized. So again, an effort to make sure everybody does things exactly the same. And here's with balance, and Rick showed us that this morning. And again, the long jump, the six minute walk. But this is a key uh, instrument that Josh developed with this. And this is a calculator. And so what you do is you put in the numbers for all of those items, those 11 items. And you have the person's sex, age, weight, and we've developed standards for people without CMT from every age, from the age of four up. And you click that lower right bear and it calculates it for you. And so you get a number uh, from zero up to 44, which is normalized for age. So now we can do these same kind of longitudinal studies that we could do in adults with, uh, with children. And in many ways, we think that this is a much better outcome measure in addition because it's much more functional. It's not just measuring things that uh, uh, we do in a static way. So again, we've been using this for about two or three years and we have data, we're putting together uh, our results of a longitudinal study this fall for this. As we've been going forward with the consortium and with the CMTA, we've also learned that there's a, a, a science which we've been developing with, uh, uh, in terms of outcome measures, that it's becoming increasingly recognized uh, uh, throughout the translational science community that patient input is critical to develop outcome measures. We could have saved us a lot of time by asking you that in the first place, but we didn't. <laughs> But now, we really are asking for input for uh, uh, developing uh, patient outcome instruments, and that's Sindhu Ramchandran, who's at the University of Michigan, and she's developed a, a disability severity index, and if people join the patient contact registry, which I'll talk about uh, uh, in a few minutes, it's really helpful for us if you go online and help participate and interact with us in actually developing these because we're developing questionnaires in concert with patients to try to look at the important things to people with CMT that they want to see uh, if we can improve over time. And CMT affects quality of life differently uh, <clears throat> than with other disease processes. All quality of life instruments aren't the same. So Sindhu has developed a specific uh, quality of life instrument that involves interactions with uh, kids and their parents to make sure that we're targeting uh, important information. 
uh, in our measures. And uh, that's not a convict on the lower picture, that's uh, David Herman, and he's from the University of Rochester, and he's done the same thing for adults with CMT. Now, it's nice to have patient outcome instruments based on exams, but sometimes, particularly when we're talking about slowly progressive diseases, it's important to develop other markers of disease progression that we call biomarkers. And uh, again, in something like CMT1A, which is pretty slowly progressive, uh, or other forms of CMT that are very slowly progressive, we want to be able to find something that we don't have to wait 10 years to see if there's an effect from a drug. And so we look for something that we can use as a biomarker of disease progression. And one thing we can do is we can look at various components of skin biopsies. But a potential biomarker that is coming out of London that we're looking at now in our consortium that we're quite excited about. And this is using an MRI of the leg. And this is not an MRI that costs thousands of dollars. This is an MRI study that takes about 20 minutes. It costs and these are research tools, so patients wouldn't have to pay for this, but it would cost us about just a couple hundred dollars uh, to do. And I'll just show you an example of this. So let me see if I can get that arrow to work again. So that is a bone. That's the femur in the leg. The resolution of this is not that great, but these are, the black is muscle. And you'll see that there's hardly any black over here. And the white is fat. So what happens is if muscle atrophy is secondary to nerve damage, the connective tissue there gets replaced by fat. And normally there's not a lot of fat, and this doesn't really depend upon how active you are, if you're an athlete or not an athlete. Uh, uh, and you see only a little bit of white on this first one here. And that's a 19-year-old man with CMT1A, and the overall amount of fat can be quantified, and that's about 1.3%. And in the middle, you see a 37-year-old with CMT1A, and here you see more white, and that fat content is 17.9%. And on the right is a, is a man with CMT1A where the fat content is 80%. And this doesn't mean that CMT1A naturally in everybody goes up from 1.3% when they're 19 up to uh, 80% when they're uh, in their 50s, but it just means that the severity correlates with the amount of fat. And in preliminary studies with just 10 or uh, 10 to 20 patients done at our London site, we're able to detect changes within a year. And so we're trying to expand that, but we're very hopeful that this MRI fat content is going to be a biomarker that we can use in clinical trials with slowly progressive forms of CMT like CMT1A. Now, the CMTA, like our consortium, recognizes that uh, people like myself aren't going to go on forever. And in fact, they may want me to go on progressively shorter times you know, <laughs> after a few of our fights here. But uh, we realize that there is a responsibility uh, for your families and for our field to generate the next, to train the next generation of uh, scientists who are in CMT. So these are just a list of six uh, investigators who we've supported uh, uh, through our consortium 100% of their salary. These are people who have finished training in neuromuscular disease uh, uh, as neurologists or the equivalent as scientists. And we have uh, uh, supported them for one to two years to really learn CMT-specific clinical or basic research. So you see Mario support on top. He's the one who brought stem cell uh, uh, techniques to our consortiums. Uh, 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 Vera Friedman in the middle there is going to lead our, uh, uh, our new Harvard uh, site. And the bottom two uh, people are actively uh, doing their training now. But all of them are taking academic positions or uh, conceivably positions in industry to be the next generation of CMT doctors. And those are ones that we've supported. 
the next slide are ones that have just worked, uh, who've been supported through other funding, but have worked with us. And there's too many, and the print's too small to, to read, but I just want you to see that uh, the CMTA and all of us uh, believe that this is really a serious responsibility to, drain, to train the next generation. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we also do is to try to involve you and provide information. And so the CMTA has an extensive website on its own. And in addition, we have this consortium website, which I'm showing you here because uh, partway down, it has the, uh, uh, the patient contact registry. And I managed to pick the color scheme so you can't read the link, which was not the brightest move I've made. But uh, I can try to uh, sh show you that later if you're interested. But if you can go on to just on to the internet and uh, type in RDCRN for the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, then you can, you'll come to the uh, front page of that. We're the consortium that has a picture of Charcot called the Inherited Neuropathy Consortium. And if you click on that, you can join the contact registry. You can either provide identifying information or not provide identifying information. Uh, but then you can link up with us and help uh, work with us as we develop these outcome measures, and we greatly appreciate that. And this is just to show uh, the distribution of people who have joined this contact registry. So you can see it's from all over the world. And we have, I think we're about 1,500 now, but we'd like to really crank up that number because this is the input we get from uh, people as we try to develop these measures, uh, biomarkers and measures of progression. And then I think a final thing that we've tried to do is to realize that we're still only 17 sites and there's countries all over the world that don't have, uh, they have only minimal expertise in CMT. And so we've developed uh, what's called the CMT International Database. And these are country-based registries where they use the same outcome instruments that we use and they have national registries led by uh, CMT investigators in all of these countries and their data is also housed at the same place at the University of South Florida so we can share data and particularly for the rare forms of CMT we can get as many patients involved uh, as possible to try to understand their natural history to try to develop uh, an understanding of what's causing the disease and to uh, look at disease progression. So with that, I'm going to uh, finish up the first part of this talk. And these are the people who have uh, worked with me uh, 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 to uh, develop this. And again, it all started with uh, the CMTA. The CMTA is a major part of it. And I thank them for that. Okay. Okay, so. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Shai. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, Steve Weiss is on the other side of the room with a microphone, and I'm here. If you have a question for Dr. Shai, could you please raise your hand, and we'll try to get to you in the next 15 minutes. And if you don't, I have a boring talk, so it's a <laughs> Yes. So the list is, uh, there is a list of the site principal investigators, which uh, I can make available. But I think also this is to uh, acknowledge again the CMTA and work by one of my colleagues, Steve Scherer, that uh, uh, they've put together a, a list of uh, CMT experts, which is far more extensive than that little list I can give you. And uh, uh, I think that that can be obtained by linking to the CMTA website. And correct me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth. Okay. Uh, do you know about the Pharynx company clinical trials? Do you know anything about that medication? I do, and we've been we've sort of known about that from the start. And uh, I'm personally am not a big fan of that. This was uh, a company that was started in France, and was. So I'm the world's worst businessman, so if I get this slightly incorrect, you know, please humor me. But basically, they started a company to, do, to uh, develop therapies for neurodegenerative diseases, 
and uh, ultimately wanted to work in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and they thought that CMTA, uh, CMT1A would be a good disease to get started with, and they didn't evaluate patients. They didn't evaluate uh, animals. What they did was they went, just looked through their computer to try to find compounds that had been reported in the literature that might affect myelin, and then somehow developed a combination of three drugs, which they've published, uh, uh, you know, in at least abstract form, none of which are very exciting. And the data that's used to support that, I think, is very weak. And all of the people I know who have worked with them have completely dissociated themselves with that. Hey, hey Mike. Yeah. Just to give you a little bit more uh, uh, background on that, uh, I've been in contact with the CEO of Farnext, and uh, recently he's uh, contacted me saying he's... Uh, he and his company are not going to pursue CMT treatments. They're going to focus on oncology. And they're asking us to take a look at what they've come up with. And uh, we will be, having said that, there's been no data backing any of it. And that's where it stands. So they're not going to be in that business. Yeah. OK, we have another question right here. I know we're talking about the future for these people, but what about who have pain that isn't uh, being controlled. Is there any studies on the pain control? So there are some uh, pain studies coming out of uh, uh, the, the consortium data, actually starting with kids. And so I'm going to answer your question at several levels to the best that I can. So first of all, it seems that for most patients with CMT, that the pain starts from structural issues rather than problems with the nerves directly. And this is work that's coming out by Dr. Ram Chandran. Um, when we see people with uh, CMT, they tend to have two overall types of pain. Uh, about 20 to 30 percent will have burning and tingling types of pain, which we call nerve pain. Those tend to get treated by combinations of medications like uh, gabapentin or pregabulin, otherwise known as Neurontin or Lyrica or uh, medications that were used previously as antidepressants, such as uh, amitriptyline. Uh, 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 there are other t pain, which occurs in probably, I've, in my experience, probably in at least half of patients with CMT when they get uh, in their middle years, which is arthritic pain, which is basically because they've had to walk on uh, feet that have high arches and you put strains on your feet that they weren't designed for. It puts strains on knees and hips and backs and those tend to get managed by the same types of, uh, of, of medications that are used uh, for people who have uh, arthritis in general. It's in general, in, most, in many cases, pain management is not perfect. It's an, an ongoing problem. There are other types of uh, uh, treatments like uh, patches with a lidocaine in them, just as an example, and uh, it's not easy to manage pain, but there's, you know, there's no magic answer for everyone, and uh, I think that's the state of the field. Yep. Do you think there's any uh, correlation between Gillian Barre and CMTA? And CMT, I mean, my father was diagnosed with uh, Gillian Barre when I was six. My sister and I both think we have. Yeah. Sharp we tooth, we haven't tested yet, but I think we do. So the vast, the you vast. Think, is there a correlation with that? So I'm going to first of all define what those are, just because you know not everybody may be familiar with it. So uh, Guillain-Barré is a uh, a peripheral neuropathy that's thought to be acquired, and people get it sometimes after they've had a respiratory infection or a GI infection, and it's thought to be an autoimmune problem, not a genetic problem. Unlike CMT1A, for example, uh, typically uh, it will occur pretty suddenly, get very, get uh, as worse as it's going to be within a month, and then get pretty much better at the, uh, in, by the end of another month. And uh, most people with Guillain-Barre, I mean, the, the vast, vast majority don't have CMT, and most people with CMT or CMT1A don't have, don't ever get Guillain-Barre. So, uh, CMT1A affects 1 in 5,000 people. CMT in general affects probably at least 1 in 2,400 people. 
and Guillain-Barre is fairly common. So there are situations where they've occurred together, but whether that's more than a chance occurrence is not known. Okay, I wanna go back to Dr. Zuckner's talk about um, patient uh, doctors reading the um, DNA results. Mm -hmm. In our support group, we can't all find doctors that are uh, really even understand uh, CMT, so how are we gonna get that information from the genome analysis back to doctors and, and them to be able to help us? How close are we to that? Well, I'm gonna answer that question, and Stefan can feel free to comment, but I'm gonna answer it in two levels. So first of all, in the old days before now, like with next generation sequencing, there was still a lot of confusion because if a particular mutation or change in a gene hadn't been reported, it was referred to as a, uh, uh, a change of uncertain significance, and it required somebody who actually knew something about CMT to interpret it. So that's one challenge. The second challenge is with next generation sequencing, uh, as I've learned painfully, uh, if it's not, you know, in many times, if it's a small family and it looks like it's a, new, a beginning of a potentially dominant type of CMT, you get a lot of candidate genes that are potential causes, a list of like 50 different ones. And it's really n not easy to sort out which of those is actually causing CMT. So even for the experts in those cases, there's no easy way of saying what's disease causing and what's not. I think that developing centers of excellence is part of, uh, uh, of the solution uh, to your question. Uh, having links uh, through organizations like the CMTA to help you when you get results back are also part of the problem. And I mean, to damn my own profession a little bit. I think if we're waiting for most doctors to learn how to interpret uh, genetic testing results, uh, we're gonna have a long wait. So, and I think that this again is a role where genetic counselors are really important. And uh, I thank God every day for having great genetic counselors in our clinic. And I don't know, Stefan, if you wanna comment, if you haven't fallen asleep back there. <laughs> <laughs> Just woke me up, Mike. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, and I want to mention what we talked about, two of us, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, that we will be, be pursuing a new project where we really want to globally kind of collect all this testing information into one database, combine it with clinical measures so the doctors can go online and, and in a very easy way see what, what the consequence might be of, of any given mutation. Yeah, and I think that's really an important and exciting point. So uh, if the federal government uh, funds us for our next cycle of our consortium, we'll be able to take care of that issue. We have the time for only one more question, Steve, so. Going back to the pain issue in CMT, going back to the pain issue in the CMT, have you heard of any success with the implanted um, spinal cord stimulators? So, so I personally haven't uh, heard of success with that, but I think that with approaches like that, you know, sometimes they work in some people and not in others, and so it's there's a rational uh, reason to think that that might be helpful because of something called the gate theory. But again, it's not something which is going to work for everyone. We have one quick question here. Sure. I'd like a clarification on the uh, four types of basic CMT. Yes. When you went into amplitude and normal speed, is that the nerve convection? Yes. Speed? Yes? Yes, in the arms. Okay, in the arms, not in the legs. Yes. Correct, because what happens in the legs is even in the demyelinating forms, the axons will degenerate, so you'll often get no response and if you just assume that that's an axonal type of CMT, that you'd be, you often be incorrect. So, so the arms allow us to distinguish between demyelinating and axonal much better than the legs. Okay. Um, yeah, a second part? Yep. Uh, how far along are we, or are you, rather, 
uh, along on the testing. Have we gone past animals yet? With the uh, CMT1A, we have not gone past animals yet. We have a, a number of interesting compounds, but we're not ready to take them to humans yet. Was there one last question over here? This has to be the last one, though. I will bring the microphone over to you. Thank you. Has there been uh, any information on the impact of nutrition? And I heard someone mention supplements, CoQ10. Is there some recommendations? Yeah, yes. So f specifically, CoQ10 and uh, uh, creatine and other supplements like that have been looked at and have not been shown to be, have any effect on, uh, on CMT. But I think with nutrition in general, it depends upon how you ask that. So there's no specific vitamin or compound that will make CMT better, and indeed we're looking for to try to find treatments to make CMT better, and if one of those worked, we'd be obviously advocating it. But with the problems with joints uh, and uh, stress on the joints, uh, like good nutrition uh, so that you watch your weight and uh, appropriate non, I mean, and like, uh, exercise that's good for your heart and lungs but easy on your joints such as you know bikes stationary bikes swimming that kind of low impact exercise stretching activities such as yoga tai chi things like that that's where uh, that and good uh, uh, orthotic uh, management I think are really are areas that can actually improve a person's life and we've seen that by our scores Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Shai. A big round of applause. Okay. Should I leave my computer here or not? Yeah, can you order no. Should I take that? I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Many of you received a blue ticket at registration. Oh. Can you pull that ticket out? If you did not receive one, that might mean that you, you've come a little late and we closed the registration table, so I apologize for that. But if you could pull the little ticket out. Um, oh, yeah, my little blue tickets are in here. We have just um, a couple little things to, to give away. Uh, one of those things, I'm going to let uh, Bob DeRosa explain what it is. Atrex donated a couple little gifts uh, to raffle off today. So would you like to? Thank you, but I, don't know if I'm I just want to give that. everybody a real quick reminder too. If you become a premium member of the CMTA, which I believe the cost is $30, correct? Yes. Atrex is going to give you a free pair of shoes. So not only do you, are you helping the association, but you're getting a pair of $110, $120 shoes for $30. So keep that in mind because it really benefits the association. So the first thing we're going to raffle off is a pair of copper socks for women. They're embedded with actual copper ions, and they help prevent bacteria, fungi, and odor on your feet. Woo! <laughs> the number is 2962462. Do we have a winner? And the next thing is a pair of men's dress casual copper socks. Sorry. That's okay. Two nine six three two five. And then the last thing is a free pair of Atrex shoes, a free pair of Atrex Linker Orthotics, and a free pair of copper socks with a retail value of $245. I'll stir them around. <laughs> 296 191. Two nine six one nine one. All right, right. I'm going to pick another number. 296-254. Oh, 
Oh, congratulations. Right after Mr. Livney's talk, we have SeaWorld tickets to give away, but I would like Patrick to give his little speech here to end our conference, and then we're going to give away those SeaWorld tickets. Thank you. I'm sorry to take the stage from you, Gina. You're a lot prettier to look at than I am. So I, I kind of saw my, uh, a, a, a flashback for me <laughs> personally, uh, and I'll, I'll talk to Gina and, uh, and uh, Elizabeth, because they made this program up, and I hope you guys have found it informative and, uh, and, and give you an idea of, it, of what we're doing. Um, so when Doc Frick, Frick was up here talking about a triple arthrodesis, that brought back a nightmare for me. And when I was 16 and 17 years old, I was diagnosed with CMT. Aspiring athlete, you think your world ends. And then I rehabbed, broke the ankle again, and they said, if you break it again, you're going to have to do a triple arthrodesis. I will tell you, I didn't break my ankle again, so I avoided the triple arthrodesis. <laughs> but it did kill a lot of brain cells when I went to college. Uh, as, as I was told um, by a renowned neurologist at uh, Columbia University at the time that I'd be in, the, uh, in a wheelchair at the age of 30. So I'm turning 53 uh, next week. They weren't right. So um, on the bracing side of the equation, I can tell you, bringing it full circle with uh, David and Sean up here, I'm one of those guys that had braces made and they're sitting on the shelf. I just want to let you know. <laughs> Not proud of it. I'm just telling you that's, that's me. So that didn't, that didn't work out too well. Dr. Zuckner, I owe a, bit, a debt of gratitude for him last year. Um, and I'm pleased to see Doc Zuckner saying it only takes about two weeks for the sequencing. Uh, I think I was one of the first in his queue, and it might have been six months, eight months, maybe a year. So we got it down to two weeks. Um, but it was the biggest gift I could give my family when I can call my brother and I can call my sister and tell them that their kids are free and they're free. Think of the power of that when I called my mom and said it wasn't her fault. I miss my dad. He passed away three years ago. I miss him every day. But... You know, everything you've seen here on diagnostics, you know, if you can remember back, way back when, you know, you, you think about Star Wars, oh, that's not going to happen, et cetera. Well, yeah, it has happened. So my Star Wars, with what you see here, in very short order, and I know it sounds crazy, is to be able to take a pinprick of everyone who has CMT, get it diagnosed, sequenced, and then customize a pill for that person and get it at the pharmacy. Sounds like Star Wars, doesn't it, right now? Well, maybe it's not so Star Wars. So what propels me each and every day and what I do is uh, certainly the kid angle, but from a family perspective, it's really important if you haven't gotten diagnosed, please do so. Um, there's a method to our madness. When we find a compound, we have to know who you are if you want to benefit from that compound. So it's really important. So thank you, Dr. Zuckner. You gave me a great Christmas present um, last year, and I'll be forever indebted. And then on to Doc Shy, I got to tell you, I got introduced to Doc Shy courtesy of doing shots after doing shots at a bar in. Grand Central Station, which is apropos because Mike does like drinking beers specifically. So, but all kidding aside, what Doc Shai is doing on a consortium level and quarterbacking this thing is just off the charts. I wanted to wrap it up. How do we uh, turn this thing on here? This. Oh, there it is. So. So we talked a lot uh, this afternoon from diagnostics, uh, genetics, 
to our strategy uh, to uh, find the first treatment for CMT. Um, I put this up uh, just to give you an idea. Mike talked about the, uh, the inside of the engines and understanding how that works. Well, this is the outside of the engine. And the outside of the engine that is really moving the inside parts in a, in a, in a concerted, concentrated, and, and logical way. The boxes on the left are identified as five different, and I can't, now I can see it, um, are the five components that we've identified that go into drug discovery. The boxes on the right are the members of the teams working on the various disease states that you see there. Um, and I suspect we'll add a recessive type in 2014 also. If I can impart one thing on this slide is this is like the all-star of all time players in the field that we're trying to get towards a treatment. All disciplines necessary to get us to that goal line are represented by the best of the best, best in class, and I don't think Mike and company would have it any other way. What you don't see on this slide is kind of the accountability behind this, the scenes. The right-hand side, we have uh, updates on the under underlying projects that are ongoing worldwide. Uh, and this year it will be on a every two-week basis. These guys meet monthly via teleconference, and the whole group here will be in person answering to the left side of the box as to the progress we have in these disease states. And I say this uh, because uh, it's, it's pretty n new dynamic in disease-based organizations. When I joined and Elizabeth joined, we were throwing darts. We were funding projects that came in via RFP, no strategy, no direction, no goal line, no goal. And now we have one. So when you take a look at the work that these, all, these people do, and these meetings and these teleconferences, they're on their time. I remind everyone, they all have day jobs. So you know the work that they're doing on behalf of the CMTA in, in many ways is pro bono. So. Um, from the standpoint of where we stand right now, I can tell you I've never been more excited. Um, the whole program has been validated by another disease state called cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease, which is brutal, and it causes more death by age 40. And I met with the CEO uh, last year who told me that he started the exact same program it wasn't called STAR for cystic fibrosis. Last year, they came out with the first pill that treats 4% of the population. And he's informed me he's got four more in the pipeline that'll treat 90. Same process, replicate the disease in Petri dishes, bombard them with all the compounds known to mankind, the 500,000 on the high throughput screening, and take the positive hits that we're looking for on an effect of the gene into drug development. That's pretty cool. It's really cool to know that something that we set out four years ago has been proven to be a pretty good process. So I wanted to let you know, uh, and on that slide that uh, has come off again, um, that we're in the process of uh, inking our first deals uh, one with the third largest pharmaceutical company in the world. Uh, and uh, we hope to be able to make an announcement in writing and PR in short order. Um, but what it means is them deploying resources and actually donating the equivalent of 10 full-time people 10 full-time people to finding a drug uh, for 1A. We have another company called ISIS that's in the documentation stages also. And what does that all mean? 
It doesn't mean we quit. Doesn't mean we've gotten there. It means we just began. It takes money and effort, and we got to continue on that path to get the resources to find that molecule. We have two other companies also um, that we filed uh, patents already on provi prov provisional methods of use on a class of compounds Mike alluded to, um, and we're pursuing that as uh, quickly as possible. So, you know, with that, I think, uh, you know, I tried wrapping up a, a really exhilarating couple days here for me. Um, a special thanks to Bob DeRosa and the Atrex company, and it's a definition of a true partnership uh, and corporate sponsor. It's not only uh, that they have great product uh, that they're making available to us. Uh, they're great people, and they're donating an awful lot of time. And from the bottom of my heart, I, I thank you, and a big round of applause for Atrex. You've also seen Allard. Allard, in the same vein, has been a great partner of ours, both monetarily, but have uh, really s spent the energy to go to sport and action groups, educate on bracing, and help. Both these companies are fantastic. Their products are, are very meaningful to the quality of life of the CMT community, and I'm grateful to Allard also. Thank you. So by a show of hands, I'm just curious, how many for the first time have met other people with CMT in this room? How you like your new family? <laughs> Welcome to the family. So you're not alone, you can see that, and you can multiply that by thousands around the country. So, um, you know, I, I thank you for coming, taking the time out here and meeting the the difference makers in our community and, some, and, and the people that are going to uh, be meaningful to, to you for the rest of your life. In closing, before I turn it over to uh, the pretty girl, Gina, you know, I want to, uh, I want to tell you I, I, I'm grateful, uh, again, for your participation um, and to quote a, uh, a, uh, one of the living legends in football. Uh, Vince Lombardi, uh, his number one speech is one of the best speeches ever given. Um, and, you know, at the end of the speech, he says that he believed in human decency. And he believed that any man's finest hours, his, his greatest fulfillment to all he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the battlefield, victorious. Take those words, we will be victorious in finding the first treatment for this disease. Thank you. Hey, is Gina coming up here? Or? Word, Pat. No, I don't. <laughs> I never have the last Elizabeth, word. Elizabeth, you want to come up here and bring those boxes? So, um, isn't he great? What a great leader we have. This man is absolutely incredible, honestly. He, we should all be very proud to have him as our leader, along with all of the docs, the researchers that are here. I hope you all had a great afternoon and a great morning, and uh, I thank Elizabeth for helping with the conference as well. So everybody, give everybody a round of applause. So um, I really wanted Pat to, have to say the last word, but we were donated uh, some items uh, to raffle off today and you know with Atrex, thank very much Bob um, and Sarah Kessley just uh, donated one of her books uh, to, 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 to us to raffle off to you so we're gonna pull a ticket um, okay. for, the book? for the book the number is 296257 oh come on oh there you go alright that's perfect <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the facilitators that helped us uh, 
with this conference requested to SeaWorld for a donation for some SeaWorld tickets. So I would like to pull a ticket for four tickets. We have eight tickets all together, um, four tickets to SeaWorld, one day admission. So that's a pretty cool prize, isn't it? Right. Yeah. All right, you can pull a ticket. 296-308. She lives in Florida, so that works out very nicely. So the next one is 296 For the t-shirt? No, 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 oh, for, for the, uh, another four passes. Oh, oh, Zero. we have did another one, all right. No way, oh. Mr. Weiss. <laughs> Woo, perfect. You'll come back, you gotta come back now. All right, congratulations. And since everybody donated something, I figured the CMTA could donate two t-shirts to you all and you all could leave here with. So I'm gonna pull both tickets at the same time. Two nine six one nine zero, and two nine six two six three. Anyone? There's one. And there's one over there. I did thank you. And over here? I am coming. Thank Elizabeth. Okay, Gina, why don't you close the conference? Okay, yes. Um, our Miss Vanna White of the CMTA, Miss Elizabeth Olet. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Elizabeth works so hard behind the scenes. For the CMTA, she is a fantastic individual. Again, just like Pat, we are lucky to have her on every level. I'm lucky to work with her. Um, I, I love you, Elizabeth. Can, thank you so much. Please give her another round of applause. Thank you all for coming once again. And don't forget to call me for those brochures or call me for those fundraisers, right? All right, enjoy thank your you. evening. Thank you. Thank you.